All right, guys, now we're going to take a look at some of the problems associated with a growing population and country. Uh, in s the United States was a massively growing pop population even during this time period. By 1775, Daniel Boone in 30 minutes cleared the Wilderness Road through the Cumberland Gap into Kentucky. But by 1819, we had had eight new states join the Union. States like Kentucky, Tennessee, Ohio, Louisiana, Indiana, Mississippi, Illinois, and Alabama. So it's not just growth in terms of going west. We're, we're growing in sort of west, north, and south to a degree. And here's a picture of Daniel Boone, this explorer and adventurer into these areas. And here's a map of the United States and what it's looking like. So that Louisiana territory is not the only thing that has allowed us to grow. And the problem with this is, as these people grow, the roads are terrible. They're washed out by rainfall. They're not well put together. So travel becomes a difficult thing. So you had private companies who were building toll roads, what we call turnpikes. They were called that because a pike is a long uh, tree there that would block the road. And in order to turn it or open the road, you had to pay a toll. And so you had to pay this tax to use the road. In 1795, the Lancaster Turnpike connected the isolated farms in Pennsylvania to the city of Philadelphia, which was the major uh, market for their goods. And that was a big, big change to be able to get your goods to market in a much more efficient means. But again, all these roads had to be built by hand, which made it kind of difficult. They were often corduroy roads built with logs to uh, prevent the washout, which could sometimes be dangerous for animals if they slipped and fell. Now, as you just saw on that previous map here in 1850, the National Road connected Baltimore to Vandalia, Illinois, which was the first federally funded road, and it opened up the Ohio area to settlement. But better than the roads were the canals, and there were few rivers that ran east to west, so you had to kind of dig that. And the canals were built to connect the rivers and lakes to increase the water travel. Now, in 1817, work began on the Erie Canal, which would connect Albany to Buffalo in New York. Locks had to be built to allow the water levels to change with the terrain over which the canal was built. But by 1825, the canal was finished, and it paid for itself within two years. It would link the economies of the Midwest and Northeast. In upstate New York, a man-made river is cutting through the wilderness. The Erie Canal is the biggest construction project in the Western world in the last 4,000 years. Over 300 miles long, dug entirely by hand, and America lacks a single qualified engineer. The United States of America isn't about to let nature stand in its way. But the land doesn't always cooperate. A wall of solid limestone, 60 feet high. Just 30 miles from the finish line, Lake Erie. The canal will change everything, linking the Atlantic Ocean to the whole middle of America. It changes where people live and why, and turns the North into a global economic powerhouse. 8 years of digging, nearly a thousand lives lost, seven million dollars, more than a hundred million today. The Erie Canal opens in 1825, a miracle of engineering, connecting East and Midwest. It's an instant economic superhighway. Fifteen million dollars of goods a year flow along the canal. Villages along the canal boom into dynamic cities, Buffalo, Syracuse, and Rochester. Goods crash in price, up to 95%. A frontier that had to be self-sufficient can now buy anything they want. Prosperity is on the move. New York City becomes a boom town. Wall Street takes off as a global financial center. The city quadruples in size and surpasses New Orleans as the nation's number one port. There's so much money around, the word millionaire is invented in 1840. 
The Erie Canal still shapes New York today. 80% of the upstate population still lives within 25 miles of it. So here you see a map of what the canal looked like in terms of its route, bringing these areas together. And this was a major thing. It was actually criticized a lot in terms of what uh, people thought it could be used for. People thought it was a foolhardy in development. But there was one division that had been lingering since the beginning, an issue that Washington, Adams, Jefferson, and Madison had avoided, the issue of slavery. Washington and Jefferson and others of his generation took the view that slavery was probably going to die away, and therefore they weren't too exercised about the fact that the federal government had no control over it. They expected that it would be gone within a generation or two, and then the problem would simply disappear. Slavery is a very complicated issue, and in fact it is the central paradox for most of American history. During the founding era, there seemed to be a gentleman's agreement of let's not talk about the difficulties of being a country dedicated to freedom with an enslaved population. But in 1818, that gentleman's agreement fell apart when Missouri petitioned Congress to be admitted to the Union as a slave state. This is going to be the big question. Missouri has allowed slavery. What are we going to do? Are we going to allow slavery to move into the Louisiana Territory? In 1820, an agreement emerged, the Missouri Compromise. It allowed Missouri into the Union as a slave state, but also admitted Maine as a free state. It says above this line, it will not be slavery. Below this line, states can have slavery. And that helped balance the number of states coming in so that no region, neither the North nor the South, would become superior to the other. But with the growth and adding of new states comes this question that's always going to be plaguing American history, and that's that issue of slavery. Up until 1865, this is always going to be a question. In 1819, Missouri wanted to become a state. The problem is that Missouri would al does allow slavery, and that would upset the balance of slave and free states in the country. There had been an equal number for quite a while. Northerners didn't want slavery to continue to expand, but the Southerners believed stopping the spread of slavery would threaten their economy. And so you have to find a way to negotiate this in order to prevent the country from ripping apart over this issue that had sort of been left unsolved since its founding. So this guy, Henry Clay, that we had talked about earlier, is represented from Kentucky. He writes out what comes to be known as the Missouri Compromise. It's a way to get both sides to agree to a solution to this problem. So the thought was Missouri would enter as a slave state, Maine would enter as a free state, slavery in the Louisiana Territory couldn't expand north of the southern border of Missouri, and future states south of that line could have slavery. The slave owners could actually travel into those states to gain, uh, to get their slaves back. Thanks, guys, for paying attention. Hopefully we took good notes.